Good evening. I'm Shar Burgess, and I want to welcome you to the Redlands Forum. This is our 11th season of forums, and we're, of course, still in our virtual format. We're glad to be able to continue to offer these programs to you, and we hope you're enjoying them. If you don't regularly receive email invitations to the uh, forum programs and you would like to, please send an email with your first and last name and email address to redlandsforum at esri.com. We will be having a Q&A this evening and uh, I would invite you to, if you have a question, just type it into the Q&A feature of Zoom, hover your mouse over the lower portion of your screen and a menu of icons like the one you see on this slide will appear. Click on the Q&A and type in the question. This, town and this series has been from the beginning, sponsored by the University of Redlands and Esri. Shelley Stockton and myself coordinate it. And as most of you know by now, it's membership based in terms of town and gown and we support scholarships for local students at the University of Redlands, and we plan fun events. And we're hoping to have many more of those in person in the coming future. So look for that as you uh, track what we are doing. Coming up next, we will host award-winning wildflower photographers, Rob Badger and Nita Winter. They have trekked some of the most arduous landscapes in the West to capture the beauty of wildflowers. They will be sharing their 27 year photographic journey and how climate change is impacting wildflowers. So very appropriately, we hope you will join us on Earth Day, Thursday, April 22nd for their presentation, which will be titled A 27 Year Wildflower Journey, The Making of Beauty and the Beast California wildflowers and climate change. And now tonight's program is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Wayne Dysinger, who is the CEO of Lifestyle Medical. He is an internationally respected physician who spe specializes in lifestyle medicine and chronic disease reversal. He completed medical school at Loma Linda University followed by a family medicine residency at Florida Hospital and a preventative medicine residency back at Loma Linda. He has worked in Guam, Atlanta, and at Dartmouth before returning to Loma Linda University, where he served as chair of the preventative medicine department from 2003 to 2014, helping to start an innovative family and preventative medicine residency that focused on lifestyle medicine and global health. An international leader in the field of lifestyle medicine, Dr. Dysinger served as a founder and past president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And he is also the medical director of the Lifestyle Medicine Institute and a professor at Loma Linda University. He has served in board or consulting roles for the American Medical Association, the Association of Prevention, Teaching and Research, the American Medical Student Association and Life, Lifestyle Centers of America. He's married with four children. He's an active athlete. He runs marathons and triathlons and he's even completed an Ironman triathlon. He loves to travel and spread the lifestyle medicine message around the world. And we welcome to the Redlands Forum Dr. Dysinger. Thank you so much, Shar, and it's an honor to be here. Um, Redlands is really one of my homes. I, I was born in Loma Linda, grew up there. Grew up there in Loma Linda, then also in Yucaipa, but uh, Redlands has always been a, a center of life for me, so it's an honor to be here at the Redlands Forum. So I'm going to uh, screen share and show some slides. 
And what I'm talking about today is really the concept of lifestyle medicine. So, so my journey, um, I'd spent most of my life as an academic physician, um, but uh, in that process, got into this concept of lifestyle medicine. And uh, it may be a term that many of you are familiar with. It may be a term that's somewhat new for some of you, uh, but it's really a, a growing concept. Um, and what we've done, been able to do over the last uh, six years is to develop a practice model that really um, looks at, at a different foundation for healthcare. Uh, and we, we started with a clinic in Riverside, then we added a clinic in Redlands. Um, so we're, we're putting uh, what we're talking about into practice with our patients on a day-to-day -day basis. So when we, when we think about lifestyle medicine, um, my perspective is that the right way to think about it is, is four pillars of health. Um, and these will be pillars that are somewhat familiar to you. Um, I'm going to go over them briefly. Um, and then I'm going to tell stories uh, around how we implement these four pillars um, with our patients and our practices. And then I, I want to leave, I, I prefer to have sessions that are interactive. We have too many people and with the virtual Zoom uh, session, it's a little hard to do that. And so I'm going to save plenty of time at the end to interact uh, via question and answer. So please, uh, store up your questions and, and we'll try to have time for those at the end. So this is a slide that I show um, pretty much all of my new patients. Um, it, it really gives the foundation of lifestyle medicine. So what I, what I tell my patients is when I went to medical school, I was trained in the first, in the top two sections of this slide. So I was trained how to give medications, how to do procedures, and really, if you think about healthcare, that's what most of our healthcare system is built on is, is the top two parts of this triangle. Uh, but if you look at what causes disease and what people spend money on, 80% uh, of it is chronic disease. And if you look at chronic disease, 80% of that is directly related to the lifestyle. So the, the things that are talked about here on the bottom of the slide. So um, when I talk about this with my patients, I say, if you were going to say, say you were retiring, you're going to build this, this wonderful uh, house uh, as, as your retirement house. And you went to a builder and said, this is, this is what I want. These are the general designs. Can you help me build this house? And if the builder said, well, I'm really good. I'm world class at the top two uh, for the top two floors, but I don't really do foundations. I don't really do first floors. I, I really just specialize in the top two floors. Obviously, you'd never choose that builder to build your, your dream house. But unfortunately, our healthcare system has evolved into that so that we spend our time uh, becoming world class on the four top two floors, but we really don't talk about the foundation enough. Um, and we really uh, need to be doing that if we're going to get at the things that we like to talk about, which is reversal of disease and remission of disease. And the nice thing is lifestyle medicine is low cost, uh, low risk, doesn't, uh, uh, is, is very natural. So it's not very invasive. Um, so if, if we start there, we feel like a lot of times we never have to move up this uh, triangle. Obviously, I still write prescriptions. I still do procedures. Uh, we do some supplements and evidence-based things in this area. We don't really do a lot because the challenge here is the evidence-based. We like to be very scientific and uh, a few things are, are quite scientific in here, but, but not a lot. Uh, so we spend a lot of time in the foundation. So just to go over each one of those uh, areas in the foundation a little more uh, specifically. So we talk about nourishment. We talk about movement. We talk about what we, we use the term resilience. And we talk about connectedness. So for nourishment, um, that's obviously the food that we eat. Um, it's actually anything that comes into our uh, bodies, uh, so it's what we drink. Um, and, and then we like to go beyond that to other exposures that we may have as we go through our life. So obviously, uh, a lot of those things are, are harmful, tobacco, um, uh, various uh, harmful drugs, uh, various toxic substances. I think we probably don't spend near enough time thinking about uh, exposures that we have to, to chemicals and 
uh, plastics and other kinds of things that, that are probably not so good for our body. So that's nourishment. Um, movement. Uh, we talk about the classic physical activity exercise, which is uh, broken down into cardiovascular training, strength training, and flexibility training. And we encourage uh, all of our patients, especially the older you get, uh, to, to think about all of those. And uh, we talk about uh, physical activity as being the best thing you can do to keep yourself young. But it's not just the kinds of physical activity you do. It's the, the format or the, the location that you do it. So we encourage our patients to, to be outside in the, in the fresh air and the sunshine. Um, we encourage them to find ways of staying active. You know, um, the other, uh, actually on Sunday, I was out in uh, San Timoteo Canyon at the, at the uh, wonderful uh, paths that they have there. And some people came by on one of these little skateboards with, with uh, uh, a wheel that was automatic. So they were out enjoying nature, which was wonderful. Uh, but but they weren't um, using their muscles that much. I mean, I guess they were practicing balance to some extent. But the point is, it matters how we do our physical activity. And of course, we can't uh, spend too much time uh, sitting uh, because uh, they say sitting is the new smoking, right? So if, if we spend too much time sitting, um, then uh, it's it's still harmful for us, even if we do physical activity other parts of the day. The second thing that, or the third area that we talk about is resilience. Um, resilience is uh, sleep and stress. Um, really just how you manage rest in your life. Um, all of us need seven or eight hours of sleep every night. Uh, it'll vary a little bit from person to person, but there's good science behind getting good, good rest in the each evening. Um, and then how we manage our stress. Stress is not necessarily a bad thing. It can be a good thing, but we have to manage it appropriately. Um, and all of this is done by uh, having rest and renewal in appropriate ways uh, as we go through our day and our week and, and our lives. And then the, the fourth pillar that we talk about in our practice is connectedness. Um, connectedness, uh, we like to talk about uh, the two planes, the horizontal connectedness and the vertical connectedness. So horizontal is your interactions with your family and your friends and your groups and networks. Uh, uh, vertical connectedness is your purpose and meaning and, and presence in life, um, sort of sort of your spirituality. Um, and I like to talk about that as, as something that uh, all of us have. All of us have spirituality at some level or another, uh, but it's, it's sort of like a thumbprint. So everyone's is different. Uh, so the, the goal is not to have a consistent spirituality uh, that's exactly alike from person to person, but just to help them stay connected to their purpose and meaning. And all of these things matter a lot from a health perspective. And in fact, if you focus on these four things, and if you create balance and, and relative health in each of these four pillars, uh, then to a large extent, uh, the rest of your health uh, falls into place uh, automatically. Uh, so, so really our job as lifestyle medicine physicians is to help people find balance in these areas and then let their body do the rest. Um, rather than this idea of, trying to fix what's broken, we try to try to nurture um, the healthy part. Um, and then our bodies are, are rather amazing uh, as far as being able to um, uh, heal us and keep us in the place that we want to be. We talk about wanting to uh, get all of our patients to 90 or 100 uh, and keep them there and, and do that in a healthy way so that they, they stay healthy. So I, I'm going to shift to um, some stories, um, and I'm going to tell four stories, one, one story for each pillar. Uh, the first story I'm going to tell is of Debbie. Debbie is actually a retired nurse. She was a, a patient that joined our, our practice when we opened our office in Riverside about six years ago. Um, and when she came in, she came in like, like this picture. So she was at that point in her early 60s, and uh, she could barely walk. She had some spinal stenosis. She had chronic back pain. Uh, she, she used a walker um, just about everywhere she went. Um, and by the way, I'm, I'm using uh, pseudonyms for, for each one of these patients, for each real patient, but this is not actually her name. Uh, but it so happens that I saw Debbie today in my office, which was, which was great to see her. Uh, and, and Debbie not only had her physical health problems uh, as far as just her mobility, 
um, in pain, but she also had uh, several medical conditions. Uh, she had uh, heart disease, she had high cholesterol, and she had high blood pressure, and she had a, a fairly fragile diabetes. So as Debbie came into our practice, we started working with her. She was someone that, that really didn't like medications much. She, she tried to stay away from medications. Um, but uh, in our practice, we do a lot of uh, unique things. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time talking about nutrition. Uh, we have 30 minute visits. So we were able to, to talk with Debbie. We have a nutritionist. Uh, so she was able to, uh, to learn about healthier eating and, and about how uh, nutrition is really, or the food that you eat is really the fuel that um, allows your body to, to move forward in health or to struggle with health. Um, and so she, by just by eating healthier, she was able to drop several of her medications. Uh, but then she, she got to a place where she was sort of stuck. She wasn't um, making continued progress. So we really started pushing her towards exercise. Um, uh, you know, when we started pushing her again, she was behind the walker. She didn't really feel like she could do a whole lot. Um, so uh, we gave her some, some guidelines. Uh, and again, we, we talk about cardiovascular training, strength training, um, and flexibility training. And we encouraged her to incorporate components of this, um, of each one of these in, in her life. Um, and what Debbie actually did is she was able to find that, that she could do pool aerobics. So she was able to join a couple different places where there was uh, water aerobics classes. Um, and she gradually got into it more and more. And it was fascinating to me to watch Debbie as she uh, started exercising more. Her whole countenance really changed. She, you could just see that that flush in her skin. Uh, you could see her her energy growing. Um, and now, when you when you look at her, uh, so Debbie, we we have a lot of groups in our class in our uh, practice, and she was one of the the more um, regular attendees at our group. And she she started coming without her walker, and then she'd start walking in with this sort of spring in her step. Um, and, and really, she looked like an athlete. She, she lost weight, she slimmed down, um, and she looked great. Um, so the, the key component here, again, is that uh, physical activity is a, a foundation. It is one of the core pillars. Um, it's something that is important for everybody at, at whatever age you're at. But the older you get, the more important it is. Um, and uh, for Debbie, it made a huge difference. She, she was stuck when she just worked on... on um, the other three pillars, but when she added the physical activity pillar in, it made a huge difference. So the second patient I want to talk about is Anna. Anna um, is 72 years old, and uh, Anna came to our practice with diabetes. Um, she had poorly controlled diabetes. She had some issues with her kidney and with her blood pressure. Uh, she'd had a history of a small stroke uh, already at a relatively young age in her life. Um, her initial health data, her hemoglobin A1C was 13.1 and her BMI was 29.7. So for those of you who, who know uh, healthcare, hemoglobin A1C of 13.1 is incredibly high. Uh, normal is 5.6 or less. So she was more than twice normal. Um, and 13.1 means your blood sugars are running 300s to 400s uh, on a daily basis. So, so very, very high blood sugar. Um, and her BMI 29.7, that means that she was almost obese, not quite obese. Uh, BMI of 30 is when you're diagnosed as obese. Uh, so she, she wasn't very healthy coming in with her, her diabetes being her biggest challenge. So uh, we talked about all four of our pillars with Anna. Um, and um, she also was someone who didn't really like to take medications. And in our practice, we're actually fine with that. In fact, our favorite thing to do is to get people off medications rather than start them on medications. Uh, so um, when, when Anna joined our practice, she started with what we call our intensive therapeutic lifestyle change program. So uh, we put her through a program where we really asked her to do a lot of things rather aggressively, change her diet, uh, significantly uh, get started on an exercise program. We asked her to come to our, our classes every day. She was working one-on-one uh, -on -one with our dietitian, one-on-one -on -one with, our, with our health psychologist. Um, we had our health coach working with her. So we were putting a lot of time and effort into Anna and she was enjoying it. 
So um, we the the intensive program that we have at, at that time the intensive program was uh, was 12 weeks in length. So she went through that intensive program, um, and then we we checked her blood uh, her hemoglobin A1C after uh, she finished the program, and the the drop was amazing. It went down to 6.6, .6, so it dropped in half. And she did that completely through uh, our program. So we didn't add any medication. We purely worked on diet, uh, on physical activity, on stress management, and on, on the connectedness through the four pillars. Um, so so in, it was wonderful, again, to, to see Anna, just the, the way we'd seen with Debbie, where her, her energy and her joy in life was coming back. Um, but as, as with all of us, life happens, right? So, so we can we can have these wonderful stretches where we do amazingly well, um, but then things will happen. Uh, a new thing will come up, some some stress in our life, and all of our good health habits uh, tend to to not hang on. Uh, so with uh, with Anna, she quit coming to our group. Um, she didn't have time for that. Uh, she Anna was actually uh, someone who. Who had some very core social struggles? Actually, she she didn't have consistent living uh, quarters. Uh, she was single. Um, she didn't have a kitchen uh, uh, a lot of the time, uh, and so her hemoglobin A1C climbed back up to to 10.1. Uh, so it never went back up as high as it was, but it did climb. Uh, but in in our practice, not only do we have the group, but we also have a system where if someone's not showing up, if someone's not walking through our doors on a regular basis, not interacting with us, uh, we reach out to them. So, so we reached out to, to Anna. Um, and uh, again, we had our, our coach working with her. We had an occupational therapist that worked with her. Um, we, we just sort of kicked in all of our um, different resources. MAC in here stands for Medical Assistant Coach Navigator. So all of our medical assistants in our practice are trained as coaches. So they were interacting with Anna. Um, and um, over time, and Anna's been our patient now for a while, um, again, for three or four years, but over time, we were able to, um, there we go, I couldn't get the slides to forward, but over time we were able to get the hemoglobin uh, back down actually this slide is old, but it says the latest was 8.7. I think her, her most recent one was in the low sevens, like 7.3 or something like that. But the point is she hasn't been perfect, but she's remained off of uh, most medications. We have had to put her on a, a couple medications, but she's still not on any diabetic medications. Uh, so she's, uh, we're working with her and uh, she's, uh, she's continuing to be in a better place than she was when she came into our practice. And again, this is three or four years later. Uh, so the point behind uh, Anna's story is that that connectedness does matter a lot. It matters uh, the community that we put ourselves in. It matters the resources that, that we surround ourselves in. Uh, I like to talk with my patients that our society, unfortunately, has made uh, living healthy uh, a challenge. Uh, so we uh, tend to be a, a, an obesogenic, diabetogenic uh, society. Um, it's, it's too easy to eat junk food. It's everywhere. Um, it's too easy to not be active. It's too easy to be stressed out. Um, and so we have to work and, um, <clears throat> we, we try to be there for our, for our patients in ways that they feel like, oh, I'm surrounded by people that are encouraging me in my health, not surrounded by people that are discouraging me in my health. Um, and this, uh, is continuing to work for Anna. So, so I encourage all of you to, to connect with family and friends, to, to join groups, uh, to be part of spiritual communities, um, or um, to, to come to our practice and join one of our healthcare support groups. We currently have six groups uh, every, that meet every single week in our practice. Uh, and they'll talk about nutrition or meditation or um, or just the idea of support. I, I believe that all of us need a time every week where we can sort of check in about our health. Uh, again, it's challenging to be healthy. Uh, so I, I spend uh, an hour every week with a friend and we just check in about our, our health. And we, we go over these four pillars and, and how are we doing in, in each of the four pillars. 
And I think we all need that. We need something. Otherwise, it, again, it doesn't happen naturally in our current culture. So my uh, third story is about uh, Michelle. Michelle is actually uh, someone who's part of our Redlands practice. Um, and Michelle is, is someone who's dealt with quite a few health issues over her life. Um, she's uh, had some heart issues. She's had some, some mild diabetes. Um, she's had some chronic pain issues. Uh, she actually had uh, multiple myeloma at one point and, and got on narcotics and, and that was a struggle for her. Um, and then she's also had some, uh, some uh, challenges as far as depression and anxiety. Um, most of that was pretty much in, in, in remission. Um, but, uh, but all of this has led to some challenges as far as sleep. Um, so uh, some quotes that I, that I put in, in a visit for her, um, she's not sleeping well, she's using Vulpidine, which is the same as Ambien, uh, one of the most common sleeping medications. Uh, she's used that in the past, but didn't really wanna use it again. Um, she, she felt like there are some stressors with her kids and so she put some boundaries around them. Um, so, uh, she, she was struggling with quite a few things, but, uh, one of her big concerns was, was her sleep. Um, so in our practice, we like to give, uh, what we call lifestyle prescriptions. So, um, when you walk into our practice, you're very likely to walk out with a piece of paper that looks like this. Um, and, and this is literally, um, the piece of paper that I gave, um, uh, I remember the name that I that I gave uh, this this story. Um, anyways, um, Michelle is, is the name I gave her. Okay, so Michelle um, uh, walked out with this piece of paper. So um, she she was given nine core strategies of sleep, which I'm going to show in a, in a little bit. She was given another handout that looked at some of the details of those nine core strategies of sleep of sleep, but then. Uh, the, the ninth strategy is meditation. Uh, we think that uh, meditation is an important component to everybody's life, actually. Um, and it's something that um, really, again, with our society that presses on us with all the technology and all the different things, that if we don't know how to quiet our mind and, and just have a, a quiet mind at times, um, it, it starts affecting us from a health perspective. So uh, I like to compare uh, meditation to, to training for, for an exercise event. So if, if you were going to, uh, say, run a marathon, uh, you wouldn't just go out and start trying to run a marathon. You'd train for it. You'd practice it. You'd, you'd gradually build it up. The same is true with meditation. Uh, I have a lot of patients who say, well, I tried that and it didn't work for me. Well, if you, if you tried to do a 5K um, without practicing, then you're, you're never going to have good success with that. Same is true with meditation. You have to practice it. You have to practice having this quiet mind. Um, so, so we encouraged um, uh, Michelle uh, to practice meditation. Um, and, uh, and then these were the, the, the nine core strategies for sleep improvement. Again, um, obviously you can use medications for sleep, but we like to, to not use medications. And in fact, if you really dig into the details of uh, sleep therapy, the, the experts at sleep, uh, they pretty much agree that medi medication is not the way to go. Uh, it may make you, it may sedate you, but as far as quality of sleep, medication doesn't really help. But these, these practices will help. And I won't spend time going into all of them, but um, you know, uh, what's called sleep hygiene, uh, comforting rituals around your bedroom and keeping it uh, cool, dark and quiet. Uh, having regular uh, times, uh, being careful with your screen times, avoiding stimulants, alcohol, and caffeine. Uh, there are foods that actually make a difference, and, and uh, Michelle got some of those foods in, in, uh, uh, in the second handout that we gave her. Um, and then exercising regularly, especially morning exercise, especially um, morning exercise in, in the sunlight. So early morning sun seems to make a difference as far as sleeping well that night. And then uh, again, the most important one, I think, um, is the mindfulness and meditation. In fact, my experience is that my patients who struggle with sleep, 95% of the time, literally 95% of the time, it's because they can't turn their mind off. And I'm, for better or for worse, I'm able to share my own stories because I have trouble turning my mind off at times. Um, and whenever I do, 
I use that as, as sort of a thermometer um, so that I, I just try to up my meditation game a little bit. Um, and pretty much always when I do, then I'll start sleeping better again. So I think that's the, the biggest thing, which is why we had given Michelle the meditation guideline. And we have other handouts that we give our patients as well around, around that. So uh, Michelle came back in a month um, and she'd, uh, she tried the meditation. Um, she initially was pretty skeptical about it, but uh, it seemed like it might be making a little bit of a difference to her. Uh, so she said, well, I'm going to take this seriously. Um, so she started meditating regularly, uh, short meditations, 10 minute meditations, but she would do it twice a day. Uh, and this, this is again a quote from her. She said, I'm sleeping better than I have in decades. So a month later, no medication, uh, just doing lifestyle kinds of things. She was sleeping better than, I, than she had in decades. So again, this is an example of, of, of our pillar of resilience uh, and the idea that rest matters a lot. Um, the idea of having a quiet mind, the idea of uh, getting that seven or eight hours of sleep. Uh, and you know, when a patient comes to me, uh, we actually have um, something that we call our lifestyle medicine uh, vitals. And those lifestyle medicine vitals are really measures of these four pillars. Uh, so every patient, every visit will check in on on how they're doing nourishment-wise, how they're doing movement-wise, how they're doing resilience-wise, and how they're doing connectedness-wise. And I find that if someone gives themselves a low score in the resilience side, so if they're struggling with, with sleep or stress, if I don't work on that, it doesn't matter too much what I say as far as uh, movement and, and exercise. I really need to just focus on, on that sleep and that stress. And, and I also, and the reason we put sleep and stress together is, um, if someone is not sleeping well, it's usually because they're stressed. Uh, and if we can work on that stress with them, generally their sleep uh, uh, comes rather naturally. And that's obviously what we were doing with Michelle when we tried to uh, help her with her meditation. So one final story, and then we'll have time for question and answer after that. So uh, again, hopefully you're uh, storing up your questions. Uh, so this story is about Mark. Um, Mark is, uh, came to us as a, as a 73 year old um, and he, he came with, with obesity. Now, by the time we met Mark, he'd already lost uh, 60 or 70 pounds. So he was about 250, 260 pounds uh, when he met us. Um, he had some, it was really pre-diabetes. It wasn't very bad diabetes, but he had some, some pre-diabetes when he joined our practice. Uh, he had some issues with, with arthritis, um, some knee pain. Um, but then his biggest concern was actually his dermatitis. And I'm going to show you some pictures of that. Um, and uh, when, when I first met um, Mark, um, he, he said, you know, um, Doc, I'm going on a cruise in about four months. Um, he, he was going on a cruise up to Alaska. And he said, when the, when the ship stops, I would love to be able to walk off the ship and walk into town a little bit. Uh, it's really tough for me right now. Uh, my legs hurt. Um, I really can't do that kind of walking right now, but if you could help me uh, to be able to do that kind of walking, uh, I'll be great. Um, and, then, and then he went on to share with me um, how uh, he'd been to doctors all around the country uh, uh, to try to help with his leg. Um, and let me see, I think I can show you a picture of the leg right away. Yeah, this, this was what his leg looked like um, when, when he presented to me. So it was this sort of red, angry, scaly kind of thing. And actually what had happened is he'd been bitten by a brown recluse spider right in the middle of where this, this uh, area was. And that was you know, many years before, but the, the poison from the brown recluse spider had, had affected his circulation in this area. So his circulation wasn't that great. Um, and uh, the different doctors he'd been to all have been all had been pretty uh, pessimistic. They'd said, you know, it's a circulation issue. There's not a whole lot you can do about that. You know, this is probably just going to get worse and worse as you go along. So he was he was rather discouraged, but um, he he wanted to give our approach a shot. Uh, so he showed up, um, and um, so we we put him on our uh, general program. We we asked him to go on a whole food plant based diet. Um, that's the approach that we take. And I'm going to talk a, a little bit more about that in a, a slide uh, in a little bit. Um, 
And then he looked at not just what he ate, but also how he ate. Uh, he also uh, took advantage of some of the resources that we have uh, our group. We have cooking classes every month. Um, in fact, we have a cooking class that's going on right now. And so I'm unfortunately missing our cooking class. Um, and he, he really just joined the culture that we've created. So we, in, in our practice, we like to think of ourselves as family. Um, and we, we really uh, care a lot about our patients and, uh, and treat them as family. And, and he really sort of became part of our family. Um, uh, he continued to lose weight. Um, this slide says down 43 pounds. Um, this, is, uh, this is a presentation that I've given elsewhere. And since then, Mark has continued to lose more weight. So he's now uh, down to, um, I, I think he's lost 60 additional pounds from, from when he started our practice. So he'd already lost 60 or so pounds before he joined our practice. And he's lost 60 additional pounds. So, so he's down to his, his ideal weight now. Um, his prediabetes disappeared. So you can see his hemoglobin A1C dropped to normal. And we don't even check his hemoglobin A1C anymore because it's always great now. Um, but what's amazing to me, and I didn't even predict this for, for Mark because uh, you, you never really know, but his leg got incredibly better. So again, this was his leg in the beginning uh, when, when he first joined our practice. Uh, and and this was the front of his leg, the same picture I showed you. Uh, this was his leg a couple months in. Um, so you can see it had gotten a lot purple. Purple is a sign of healing. Uh, so it, it was improving. Um, there wasn't that scaling. There wasn't that angry redness. Um, and then this was his leg um, in, a, in a, this was probably seven or eight months into being part of our practice. So a dramatic change in his leg. Uh, and guess what? He went on that cruise and he was able to walk everywhere he wanted to walk. And in fact, um, I'm going to jump to this next slide. Uh, Mark now, uh, his favorite uh, hobby is playing uh, Frisbee golf. So he goes out and plays Frisbee golf on a regular basis. And any of you who have played Frisbee golf, that involves a lot of walking and a lot of walking sometimes on rough terrain. So not only did his leg get better, but he's really thrived. Now, um, Mark availed himself of all four of our pillars, but the one that probably made the biggest difference with him uh, was uh, the pillar that we talked about first, nourishment. And that's generally the most controversial pil pillar. Everyone has their own opinion on, on what you should do as far as uh, nourishment. But we follow the guidelines of Michael Pollan. Michael Pollan is a journalist who did a lot of research on food. Um, and he wrote, he wrote a book called In Defense of Food. He's written several very good books. Uh, the omnivores dilemma is one of them. But in defense of food, uh, an eater's manifesto, uh, he summarized all his food research with these um, seven words, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. So this is in fact our uh, nutrition guidelines, uh, eat food. Uh, eat food means eating whole food. Um, one of the, or probably the biggest challenge in our society is processed food. Um, so we need to be eating whole food, which means food the way it's grown, uh, not too much. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that we do in our practice to help people eat not too much, including um, we, we do group fasts. So um, three times a year, we'll get uh, usually it's 20 or 30 people, and we'll, we'll spend five days going through uh, a fast together. And it's not a, not a pure water fast, um, but it's a, a very specific uh, cleanse kind of program. And these kinds of things we need to incorporate into our, our life a whole lot more. And then mostly plants, it doesn't mean that you have to be uh, vegan or even vegetarian, um, but it does mean mostly plants, literally uh, the majority of your calories. And we actually think that probably close to 95% of your calories uh, should come from plants. Uh, and the reason we say 95% is that if you look at the studies of uh, the um, different, uh, say, say some of the tribes, uh, the Shamani Indians in, in Bolivia, some of the Amazon jungle tribes, or even the historical data that we have around how our ancestors used to eat two or 300 years ago, no matter what culture, um, they, they tended to be around 95% of their calories were coming from plants. So you can debate that, but, but that's sort of a general guideline to go for. So that's the, the end of uh, the talking I wanted to do. Um, so we have uh, 
15 minutes or so left um, where we can uh, talk about, uh, we can answer questions and, and just have a, a general discussion. Um, and I will leave this slide up. It has my contact information. So anybody who wants to email me, uh, you can do that. It also has um, uh, our office phone number if you're interested in that. Um, so Shar, tell us about uh, any questions that people may have. All right. Uh, the first one, a person would like to know if you went to Ukaipa High School and if yes, what year? <laughs> So great question. I actually did go to Yukaipa High School, but I did not graduate from Yukaipa High School. I only went there um, for some summer classes. And that would have been, um, well, I graduated from high school in 78. So I would have done some summer classes probably the summer of, probably the summer of 76 and 77 in that, in that area. So quite a few years ago. Well, they're very excited to know that you even spent a few days there. So that's great. Um, then they would like to know, uh, does Lifestyle Medical accept ESRI insurance? And there's another insurance uh, question as to whether Medicare covers Lifestyle Medical. Yeah, so let me just, just talk briefly about what how, how our practice works uh, from a financial perspective. If you have Medicare, um, and it doesn't matter really what type of Medicare, you can have uh, Medicare B, the original Medicare, you can have Medicare Advantage, uh, which is Medicare C, uh, pretty much any type of Medicare, um, uh, you're welcome in our practice. We accept most of those, in, we accept pretty much all Medicare insurances that are out there. You know, you can be with Scan or Blue Cross or um, pretty much United, anybody. Um, so, so we're happy to accept you. and. Uh, the way Medicare reimburses us, um, all of the things that we do are, are free, um, so there's no extra charge for that. Um, if you do not have Medicare, so if you're under 65 and you're on a commercial insurance, uh, there's two ways you can join our practice. One is um, you can you can join as a as a member, um, and um, this is well actually let's start with if you have insurance. Um, we accept most insurances. Um, again, PPOs, HMOs, we accept most insurances. We don't accept Kaiser, unfortunately. Um, we don't accept IEHP either, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but we do accept most all other insurances. Um, but because we do a lot of unique things and, and different things, we have long appointments, we have a lot of doctor availability, we have, you know, these, these other, uh, you know, the, the groups and the uh, dietitians and all these other kinds of things. Um, we, we have to charge a little bit more than insurance pays us, so we have a membership fee that's $18 a month. So it's, it's not very expensive, $18 a month. That's uh, uh, more than or less than you pay for a cup of coffee, if you get a cup of coffee uh, uh, on a regular basis. Um, so, so, so that's if, if you have insurance that we can accept. If you don't have insurance that we can accept or if you have a very high deductible, we have another program that's $78 a month. Uh, so uh, we'll give you everything that we have for only $78 a month um, uh, without any, any, any insurance reimbursement. So that's sort of how it works uh, from a financial perspective uh, in our practice. Um, then the, the other question was specifically around Esri. The last I knew, um, Esri health insurance was contracted in ways that didn't make us available. I've I've had several patients from Esri, but I think most of them have paid that seventy-eight dollar a month uh, fee. We would love to work with Esri, so if anybody's listening to this and wants to figure out how to connect us to Esri, we would love to uh, to be available to to uh, employees of Esri. We we'd love to be available to anybody who who is not. Uh, available to us right now, but we're, we're available to most people, but a lot of employers, and I think last I knew Esri was one of these, um, they sort of limit uh, the network that you can can go to, and I don't think we're part of Esri network at the moment. Another person asked about United Healthcare, but you said you accept most. So. We, we accept United, we, we accept most health insurances, um, but uh, again, 
for, so for instance, Esri, I think, I believe, and I'm, I'm not 100% sure on this, so I may be wrong, but I believe Esri mainly contracts with United. But uh, again, different employers have, have different ways that, that they set up their, their networks. And um, we're, we're, we're new to the area. So probably no one's really considered us at Esri, but uh, we'd be happy. We're, we've grown and we're, we're substantial. Our office uh, in, in Redlands is not very far from Esri. So, so we'd be happy to, to be, to be uh, available to Esri employees or, or anybody. Great. Okay, this person has a little more involved question. As someone in my early 20s, I've caught myself sometimes dismissing unhealthy habits, late nights, junk food, skipping exercise day, and so forth, on the premise that I'm young and nothing serious can happen to me. Even the four stories you shared were about people in their 60s and 70s. What are the perhaps hidden benefits of taking the four pillars seriously early on in life? Yeah, that's a great question, and uh, I really appreciate whoever is asking it to uh, to to have that kind of insight and, and those kind of thoughts. So, um, you know, I I think if if there's one take home for all of us, actually, whether you're 20 or whether you're uh, 80, um, it's to 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 give yourself a regular time where you think about your health and you check in on on your health. I, I compare it to going to church or, or mosque or synagogue or, or wherever uh, you may uh, do tune-ups on your spirituality. I think you need to do tune-ups on your, on your physical health on a regular basis, I think at least uh, every week. Um, so I'd encourage you to, to think about ways you could incorporate that into your life, uh, to have a, a regular way you sort of check in on your health. And, and obviously, um, you know, if you look at uh, one of the titles of this talk was, was about the blue zones. And um, you know, most of us in, in this neighborhood have heard of the blue zones because Loma Linda is one of the blue zones. And, but if you, if you look at the, the magic behind the blue zones, it'll save you 10 years or so of life. So if, if you start adopting healthy habits when you're 20, um, then it, it will, I mean, this is well documented. Um, it'll, it'll give you 10 years of extra life. So 10 years of extra life, um, makes a difference to you, then, then uh, start, start doing it early. Um, but um, it doesn't really matter when you decide to adopt. Uh, I did not, when I left Loma Linda, I did not think that I was going to be mainly serving seniors. Our practice right now serves seniors more than anybody else, primarily because of how the reimbursement works. Um, but we're actively looking for ways to, to serve younger people because we want to help people uh, do that whole 10 years of life. But even if you're a if you're not young, even if you're a senior, you can make a, a big difference, just like uh, the stories that I told tonight. Um, so uh, that was a long answer to a, to a great question. But the bottom line is, find a time to take health seriously uh, every week. Um, and uh, the, the benefit is potentially 10 years of extra life. Okay, uh, this person wants to know whether their ailments might be appropriate for your practice. Well, uh, what I'll say to that is, is we, we treat everyone. We're primary care doctors. Uh, we, we have uh, currently two doctors and, and one uh, physician's assistant in our practice. We, we've been growing, so we have a, a third doctor coming in uh, in July. Um, and, and all of us are trained in primary care as well as this concept of lifestyle medicine. So we all practice the same way. Um, and um, we, we take all ailments. So um, there's really not an ailment out there that, that we, we wouldn't take. Obviously we're primary care. So we, we refer people to specialists when that's needed. Um, but you know, if it's you know, heart issues, lung issues, stomach issues, muscle aches and pains, anxiety, depression, um, kidney, kidney problems. Um, we'll take on all of those things. Okay, this person would love to go on a plant-based diet, but she is allergic to soy, cow's milk, and nickel. So follow a low nickel diet 
which means no beans, nuts, seeds, oats, and basically most plant-based foods. And she says she feels stuck. So that's fascinating. And, and it would be fun to, to try to, to get our hands around that. Um, the, the challenge, um, it sounds like the biggest challenge there is the nickel. I mean, you can, you can get by just fine without soy and you can get by just fine without uh, dairy. Um, that's really not too hard. Uh, it's, you have to think it through, but it's not too hard. But the challenge is, is the nickel from my perspective. So, uh, you know, if, if someone who had a nickel allergy uh, showed up at my practice, then I would spend some time trying to understand that nickel allergy, um, you know, the, the details of the exposures and the details of um, what was tolerated and what wasn't tolerated. Uh, what we know is that with a lot of allergies, uh, sometimes you can find a way to decrease those allergies. Uh, this has been shown uh, most dramatically with peanut allergies. Uh, where, you know, it used to be, we'd say, if you have a peanut allergy, you need to stay far, far away from peanuts. But now uh, there's more and more data that you can start with very small amounts of peanuts, sometimes just minuscule, almost uh, microscopic amounts of peanuts and gradually add more peanuts and, and your body develops a tolerance. Uh, just like the, the concept that, that farmers have less hay fever than people who live in the city, uh, the exposures that you have help uh, to protect you. Uh, so I, I would want to explore all of that with the nickel allergy. Um, and who knows what, what ways we could find, but uh, I suspect um, we could find a path forward. Um, but, but again, you know, this was someone who wanted to be plant-based. Uh, we, we lean towards plant-based, but you don't have to be plant-based to be healthy. Um, but we would explore all of that with you. Um, and presumably we could plan a path forward. We, we, we do some, some unique testing as well, uh, looking at uh, food absorption and, and uh, food sensitivity issues. So we could do all of those kinds of things as well. This person uh, says, my apologies, I logged in late. Can you repeat the four pillars? I'm sorry, I missed that. Apologies, what? <laughs> She logged in late, and so she would like you to repeat the four. To review the four pillars. Okay. Um, so the, the four pillars. Um, so these four pillars come from Dr. Dean Ornish. Um, we've modified them, so he doesn't use quite the same terminology that we use. But um, Dean Ornish is, is one of the lifestyle medicine uh, founders. He's quite famous. Uh, he was a doctor to President Clinton and has written a lot of books. Um, but uh, the pillars are... Uh, the way we use them, uh, nourishment, which is uh, food and water and, and what you take in, uh, movement, which is exercise and the environment that you exercise in, um, uh, resilience, which is sleep and stress and, and how you manage rest in your body, uh, and connectedness, which is, uh, we talk about horizontal and vertical connectedness, so it's your family and friend networks, as well as your, your purpose and meaning in life and your spirituality in life. So those four pillars uh, we spend our time trying to balance those in our patients. Um, and what we find is if we balance them, uh, then their bodies tend to take care of themselves to a large extent. Obviously, we still have to do traditional doctoring stuff every once in a while. But to a large extent, your, your bodies will take care of themselves if those pillars are balanced. This person said, I'm a therapist and I've been advocated for using all the muscles of the spine with walking backward as much as you walk forward. With people that have back pain, I have found they no longer have back pain. Okay, so so I think what I heard was a physical therapist who's found that walking backwards is is an important part of of that movement um, pillar. And I haven't seen the the science behind walking backwards, but um, uh, I've seen people practicing it. Um, it looks interesting. I've never tried to practice it much myself, but I, I could believe that there's value in that. So, um, you know, it, it, again, I, we, we sort of like to, to see the papers, um, the scientific evidence, but I, I could imagine that there could be. So I'll, I'll just take your word for it. There you go. And uh, this person would like to know how you treat mental health issues and is your practice considered a naturopathic 
So we're not a mat- naturopathic <laughs> clinic. We're a, we're a typical um, medical practice, um, but obviously we have a different foundation to what we do. Uh, so we actually may feel like a, a naturopathic clinic to some people, but uh, naturopathy, that's a, a specific degree and none of our practitioners are trained in naturopathy. We are all trained in lifestyle medicine. We're all boarded in lifestyle medicine. There's a board certification in lifestyle medicine. Um, and um, so we so we do have that training, but not, not actually naturopathy. Um, and then what was the other part of that question? Uh, that was about, I'm sorry, it seemed like someone was very efficient and sent it away. So that, that's fine. So, so we, we do um, practice very naturally, but, but we're a medical clinic, uh, not, a, not a naturopathy. And then uh, we had a question about a uh, resource to get started with meditation. Resources for meditation. So, so there's a lot of different resources. Meditation very quickly um, uh, starts overlapping with spirituality. So, so different um, spiritual uh, faiths or or belief systems will have different types of meditation. So that's actually a good place to go uh, to your to your faith base. Um, if you want something that's purely scientific, um, I recommend something called the relaxation response. Uh, the relaxation response, you can Google that uh, and you can find the guidelines for the relaxation response just by Googling. Uh, but that was developed by Herbert Benson, who's a physician at Harvard University. Um, and he's he some of the some of the better um, research behind the value of meditation for specific things like high blood pressure or or uh, other health issues um, comes out of Dr. Benson's uh, Institute, uh, the Mind Body Institute at Harvard University. And this person is about your views on the end diets, like keto, oil-free diets, and so forth. Yeah, so so there's there's a lot of fad diets out there. Again, nutrition is a very controversial uh, thing. Um, the, I, I tell my patients the two things that everybody agree, agrees on, at least my perspective, pretty much anybody who, who has any value in the nutritional world agree on. Uh, one is that we need to have less processed food. Um, pretty much every nutritionist agrees on that. And the other is that we need to eat more vegetables. Pretty much every nutritionist agrees on that. Uh, so we, we spend a lot of time talking about both of those. Um, you know, I, I don't find the, the science behind keto diet to be as compelling as, as the science behind this, this whole food plant-based uh, approach. Um, but whole food plant-based, there, there are some people who, who will take on a keto diet and try to be whole food plant-based. So they eat a lot of nuts and avocados and coconut and those kind of things. Um, the, the science around keto is newer. Um, so, so we have decades of research uh, around whole food plant-based diets. Uh, we have uh, not near as much research around keto diets. So keto diets, there's evidence that it will help short term, uh, but not much evidence it'll help long term. In fact, some of the evidence that I've seen uh, indicate that keto actually may be harmful for you long term. So, um, you know, and Again, I, I, I love talking nutrition. I've spent a lot of time learning nutrition. So uh, I'm sure we don't have time to go into all the details as far as different uh, nutritional conversations that we can have. But if you're interested, um, come join our practice. Uh, come to some of our groups. Uh, I'll have as much nutrition conversation with you as you'd like. This person would like to know if you have patients come to your practice who are already healthy and looking to maintain good health or is it mostly patients who are needing to reverse a chronic disease? We, we have a lot of both. Um, we, we have a lot of patients who, you know, especially we, we've been around now for six years. So we've, we've been around long enough to develop a reputation. So a lot of people who are interested in more natural approaches will, will show up because a friend or someone told them about us. Um, but, uh, you know, initially no one, we didn't have that reputation. So everyone that showed up 
uh, had significant health issues. So, so we still have a lot of both. We have people that, that show up who, who our job is mainly to, to help them maintain their health because uh, they're already very healthy. Um, but then we have people who show up with, with pretty major health issues and including a lot of health issues that, that they've doctor shopped, they've been around a lot of different places and then they end up with us. Um, so we do both. The other part of the question that we missed earlier was about uh, your treatment of mental health. Oh, mental, mental health. So yes, thanks for coming back to that. Um, I, I love to work, um, in fact, all of our practitioners love to work on the mental side of health. It's, you know, it, it fits a lot in resilience. Um, it also fits a lot in connectedness in those two, four, those two of the four pillars. Um, but actually all four pillars matter a lot as far as mental health. So uh, there are foods that you can eat that actually help you um, with depression that will help you with anxiety or, or other components of, of your mental health. Exercise is one of the best things you can do to help yourself with mental health. So, so we apply all four pillars around mental health. Uh, we, we have a, uh, someone who has a master's in social work that's, that's uh, one of the advisors in our practice. So we have that resource available. Um, so, so we spend a lot of time uh, thinking about that, looking about looking at that. We don't really spend a lot of time separating mental health from physical health because it's all us, you know, whether, whether our challenges um, are, are something that's traditionally called mental health or something that's traditionally called physical health. It's all, all wrapped together and, and we, um, we just like to get people healthy. Um, so, so we uh, apply yeah. the pillars in, in all aspects. Yeah, we have a person asking if you'll put the slide up again, showing the four pillars. So probably the best way to do that is to go clear back to um, this slide shows them, but it doesn't have the words. This slide uh, puts the words there um, in the bottom of the triangle. I think that's what they want. Someone is asking if you treat people who live out of state. So that's a good question. Um, the answer to that right now is yes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm only licensed in California right now. Uh, but when the pandemic came, um, my license all of a sudden became good uh, no matter what state. Uh, so right now I have patients in New Jersey and North Carolina and Texas and uh you know, all, all around the U.S. Um, but we don't really encourage that a lot. We, we prefer to have some one-on-one -on -one interactions, face-to-face -face interactions with our patients. Um, so most of my patients that are uh, out of state um, have been to California, have been to our office, um, but not all of them. Um, so, so we're open to other things, but um, we, we don't market that. We, we try to primarily stay in and I don't know how long, you know, as the pandemic recedes, I don't know how long my license will actually work in other states. Um, but currently it does, and, and we do have patients in a variety of different states. This person would like to know if you recommend uh, being vegan, and where do you stand on eating meat? Do I recommend be, being vegan, and where do I stand on eating meat? Right. Um, so... Those are always loaded questions. Um, so I, I'll say this, I'm primarily vegan myself. I'm not 100% vegan, but I'm primarily vegan myself. So that says that I, I believe in that concept um, generally. Um, I don't think that the scientific evidence says you, you need to be vegan. Um, uh, so, so I don't tend to push veganism on my patients. Um, I do have some patients who, um, so, so for instance, in the stories I told for Anna, uh, for her hemoglobin A1C to drop from 13.1 to 6.2, um, she, I, I, I had her go vegan. Uh, so there are certain clinical situations where I feel the right thing to do is to go vegan. Um, but um, most of my patients are not vegan and, and and most of them don't need to go vegan. 
but they do need to go towards whole food and they do need to go towards more plants. Uh, the average uh, American doesn't eat enough plants um, and uh, eats way too much processed food. So, so most of my patients, I'm taking uh, that direction, uh, but most of them don't have to go all the, all the way towards veganism. A few more questions here, so we'll try to speed through them. Um, is there an optimal time of day to practice meditation? That's a great question. Optimal time of day to practice meditation. So I'll, I'll say this. What I've found is that if, if I have a patient, so my most common time I prescribe meditation is, is if someone's having a hard time sleeping. Um, I think meditation is way better than, than medications uh, to help people sleep. Um, but what I found is that if someone's having a hard time sleeping, and they they try to practice meditation in the middle of the night of the night. It doesn't really work. Um, so so I encourage them to practice meditation sometime during the day, and then it somehow carries over. Uh, and you can still try to practice it in the middle of the night. So it doesn't mean you shouldn't practice it in the middle of the night, but it's usually not enough. Um, I personally tend to do it in the morning. I think that's probably the most common time people uh, practice meditation is the morning, but I don't think it really matters. Um, uh, you can you can do it, you know, midday, you can do it in the afternoon, you can do it uh, early evening. Um, so, so I don't think it really matters and I haven't seen science that sort of pushes you one direction or the other. Um, the, the key thing is that you do practice it somehow. And again, you, you create that ability to have a quiet mind um, which a lot of us uh, don't do very well at it. Do you have examples of patients with type 1 diabetes? So type 1 diabetes? Yeah. So, so we do talk about disease remission and, and reversal uh, in a lot of situations. Um, we would not talk about disease reversal in type 1 diabetes. Um, Type 1 diabetes has a different physiologic mechanism. Um, so, so our program can have a lot of benefits for someone who has type 1 diabetes, um, but it would not be able to put it in, in remission or reversal. You would incorporate bioidentical hormones in your practice. Um, so the question is about bioidentical hormones. Um, we do use bioidentical hormones, some in our practice. I actually was taught how to do that when I was at the Center for Health Promotion at Loma Linda. Um, we don't do it a lot. Um, I think the, the window for bioidentical hormones is maybe not as large as, as some other doctors do, um, but, but it is more natural and we like to be more natural. It's, it's sort of in this part of the triangle, the, the bioidentical hormones sort of fit here. So it's, uh, it's a little more natural and there's some evidence behind it. The evidence behind it, I think is a little mixed. Uh, so we don't do it a lot, but we do we do do it some. Are your support groups available to non-members? You know, when we when we started off uh, our practice, we did have the support groups available to non-members. Now our practice has grown, and, and so they're not available to non-members. You have to be a, a member to to be part of our our support group. Um, we do offer other things. Uh, we our cooking classes. You don't have to be a member to, to join our cooking classes, uh, and those are generally the second uh, Tuesday of every um, month. Um, and and there's other resources that we have on our website and other places that are available to the non-members. And this is a rather involved question. Have you had success treating people with MAC, Mycobacterium avium complex? Do we treat people with mycobacteria avium complex? We do. Um, that can be a challenging disease. Um, as in any disease, you know, getting the pillars right in your body will help you uh, deal with it. Um, I'd have to review the 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 details of of a particular person's journey with with mycobacteria avium complex. Um, generally, um, there would be some more traditional medicine that would help would, you know, I mean, like antibiotics and, and those kind of things that would, would, um, be part of that treatment as well. 
can. I, I would not want to claim to be an expert in mycobacterium avian complex, by the way. So um, I'd be happy to go on a journey with you on that, but um, I can't say that I've treated a thousand patients for that. Answer one, uh, this person wants to know if you treat mental health disorders. We do. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I sort of talked about that uh, earlier, you know, anxiety, depression, uh, all those kinds of things we treat. Um, uh, we have patients who have been diagnosed with bipolar, with uh, schizophrenia, um, a variety of different things like that. Um, the, you know, mental health, there's a lot of different challenges there. Um, the four pillars work to some extent with mental health, but again, uh, there are some of the some of the challenges that that um, need resources above and beyond uh, the lifestyle, they need to go further up in this triangle up to, to maybe some medications and those kind of things. But um, we have all of those kinds of patients in our practice for sure. And then we have a number of people who have simply written in to say, Thank you. They very much appreciated what you had to share. So I think that takes care of all the questions we have. And it's just a pleasure to have had you on our program and we really appreciate your time. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, we appreciate the opportunity and um, it's an honor to be uh, part of the Redlands community.